Hey, greetings, everybody. Gleekon here again with another episode of Lore of Warcraft. Uh, we left off last time with the a little talking about the Sons of Lothar. They've actually already been mentioned and, and kind of explained in the in the novel, which is just it's kind of what the people who served in the in veterans of the Second Great War um, kind of referred to themselves as. So in Chronicles, they talked about how Kedgar feels the need to go to Draenor because they've learned they they capture a death knight they torture it using the power of the light again and they uh find out what the horde's true plan is which to, is to invade other worlds and they feel like they can't allow that fate to befall anyone else so <clears throat> they uh they uh make a plea make a call to the sons of Lothar to see who joins up all the heroes do join up in a, in a big majority of the forces and they storm through the portal uh, or, they, or they intend to start storming through the portal. They kind of like take the outside of the portal, which really gets us up through the end of Act 1 um, and all of the Horde campaign done. So stay a while and listen to this one's Chapter 13. We'll see how far we get, what version of that tale gets us in this uh, short term. <clears throat> Kadgar was in the meeting hall, one of the few completely finished structures in Nethergard. He had wanted to stay on the parapet and continue lending a hand against the Horde, but Turalyon had convinced him to rest for a few minutes and eat something. Archmage or not, you're no good to us if you're fainting from hunger or fatigue, his friend had pointed out. It was sound advice, and so Kadgar had let himself be led over here and had dutifully eaten the bowl of stew someone had placed in front of him. He remembered that much, and now he supposed he must have fallen asleep. He was dreaming, and the dream was bittersweet, for in the dream, Kadgar was young. He turned his clean-shaven face to the night sky and let the moon bathe it, the wind tossing his hair that was dark, save for a single streak of white. He lifted his hands, marveling at how young and strong they looked, ungnarled and unspotted. He strode across Lordron like a giant, each step carrying him whole leagues, his head brushing the clouds. It was night, yet he walked surely and without hesitation, his feet knowing the way. He found himself heading toward Dalaran, and forded the lake in one step to stand beside the mage city. Light poured from a single room in the violet citadel despite the late hour, and Kangar focused his attention there. He began to float upward, growing smaller as he approached the room. As his feet touched down on the balcony, he was his normal size again. The door was open, and he entered, pushing aside the gauze curtains that kept out bugs but allowed moonlight. Welcome, Kadgar. Come and join me. Edgar was not surprised to see Antonitis there and to realize that these were the Kirin Tor leader's own chambers. He sat in the proffered chair and accepted a glass of wine from the other Archmage, amused that for once Antonitis, with his long brown beard just beginning to gray, actually looked the senior. Normally it was Kadgar whom strangers thought the elder mage thanks to his snow-white beard, even though in reality Antonitis had several decades of experience over him. <clears throat> I wonder when Kadgar loses the whole beard. That's a wow thing or what? He doesn't have one really in the. That's not how they show him in the in the novel. Uh, I mean, I'm sorry, in the game manual either. So this is just an, how they're picturing him for the purpose of this novel. And well, I mean, in the other, like the the last novel as well. Thank you, Kedgar said quietly after they'd both sipped at their wine a moment. He gestured at his boyish face, his powerful, slim youth's body. For this, and tonight it looked a bit uncomfortable. I thought I would make this as pleasant as possible. I've missed it, being young. I wouldn't change a thing. Medivh had to be stopped, and most of the time I don't mind. But sometimes I miss it. I know. Kedgar changed the subject. I take it this is no ordinary dream. And tonight it shook his head. No, unfortunately not. I have grave news to impart. The black dragon flight has allied itself with the horde. It took a great deal of will not to choke on his wine. <clears throat> the black dragon flight? Kedgar repeated. But what are the red? The two dragon flights were mortal enemies. His host shrugged. They have not been seen for some time. It may be that they have finally broken the horde's control, he frowned. But the orcs have found new allies, and it seems to us willing ones this time. Kadgar shook his head. Are they heading toward Nethergard? 
We don't know, Antonidas admitted. Perhaps they have already been here and to Alterac as well. His frown became a full-fledged scowl. They stole the eye of Dalaran, Khadgar. The eye? Khadgar knew well what kind of blow that was to Dalaran. But what does the Horde want with it? I know not, but they were here specifically to steal it, Antonidas confirmed. A handful of Death Knights managed to get past all our defenses, take it, and use the dragons to escape. Dragons that shortly thereafter slaughtered the Alliance forces watching Alterac. No doubt at that traitor Paranold's command. <clears throat> Khadgar made a face. I wonder how Paranold managed that. Yet another mystery. I know how much you're dealing with already, Khadgar, but I thought you should know. Thank you, Khadgar told him and meant it. Yeah, I'd rather know, he frowned thoughtfully, reaching to stroke his, stroke his beard and momentarily nonplussed to find only his bare chin. Perhaps I can even find out why these things happened. First, the Book of Medivh. Now the Eye of Dalaran. Why these specifically? He set his wine glass down on Antonidas' desk and stood reluctantly. I should be getting back. Back to being a boy in an old man's body. Back to watching Illyria and Teralia in an act of painful drama of denial and hurting and solitude when any fool could see they would be stronger and happier together. Back to fighting orcs and closing portals and bearing the weight of the world on his artificially aged shoulders. He sighed heavily. As you wish. Good luck, my boy. Antonidas waved his hand and Khadgar awoke, sitting up at Netherguard's meeting room table. He was back in his elderly body now and felt a wistful pang as he regarded his withered hands and long great white beard. Rising, Khadgar left the dream in the meeting hall behind. He spotted Teralyon and a few others at the main gate. <clears throat> they were clustered around a new prisoner. They looked up as he approached and stepped back. The Archmage suppressed a shudder as he saw the creature's rotting, once-human face and glowing red eyes. Khadgar, Teralyon called as he noticed his friend. I was just about to send for you. I assume you needed my help with this one. Was the light ineffective? Teralyon looked frustrated. Quite the contrary. His reaction was so extreme, I was afraid I was going to kill him. I thought perhaps you... Of course. Khadgar sank down to a crouch beside the prisoner, meeting his fiery gaze. Do you have a name, Death Knight? The creature merely snarled, writhing against his bonds. They held fast, however. That's the way you want it, said Khadgar, shrugging. He summoned power to him, then focused that power into a tight beam. The spell easily pierced the horde creature's defenses as Teralyon's light probably had, but although the Death Knight stiffened, he was not so maddened by agony that he could not speak. And speak he would. Your name. The de Bless you. The knight, death knight glared at him, murder in his eyes, but his mouth opened and formed words of its own accord. Gaz, old ripper. Good. Now how did the horde reopen the portal? Khadgar demanded as Teralyon and the others crowded close behind him. No, Zul, he replied. Zul used the skull of Gul'dan to force the rift open. Is such a thing possible? Teralyon asked. Entirely, Khadgar said. It's starting to make sense now. We know Gul'dan created the Dark Portal in the first place, working together with Medivh. It's likely that his remains would still have a link to it, and therefore could be used to gain greater, greater control over the Rift, just like the Book of Medivh. Nergil had needed Gul'dan, or at least his skull, to open the Rift again, and without that skull, Khadgar couldn't shut it either, not completely. Now he understood why the Rift had remained before. Without using Gul'dan's skull, Khadgar would never be able to seal the rift for good, and without the book, he wouldn't be sure he was using the right spell. He felt a tap on his shoulder. Glancing up, he saw Teralyon gesturing him to step away. Puzzled, Khadgar complied. Good news, Teralyon said. Our forces are driving the horde back toward the dark portal. We also had word from Admiral Proudmoore. Other groups of orcs are running, too. Apparently a band of horde orcs, backed by black dragons, if you can believe it, stole several boats from Menethor Harbour recently. Khadgar sighed, remembering his dream conversation with Antonidas. I can't believe it. What? Wait. You said boats? 
I, they headed southwest into the great sea. Kadgar gripped Turalyon's tunic. Southwest? Damn it! What is it, Kadgar? They're not running. The boats, they were heading for the tomb of Sargeras. Gul'dan tried that once and it killed him. Why would the orcs do that? Medivh is dead and Sargeras is gone. The tomb's empty. His eyes widened slightly. Isn't it? It all clicked into place. Sargeras is gone, Kadgar said slowly, but that doesn't mean the tomb is empty. We know the orcs are seeking artifacts. What if Sargeras left something there? The tomb was shielded so that no creature of Azeroth could enter, but the orcs were never from here. The wardings would mean nothing to them now, just as they meant nothing to Gul'dan when he... That's it. That's gotta be it. Edgar turned back to the Death Knight and dropped to his knees beside the creature. Why did Nerjul send orcs to the tomb of Sargeras? he demanded. Gaz Soulripper laughed, foul breath from dead lungs caressing Kudgar's face. He'd pulled tightly into himself in the few moments of respite and was not about to say anything. Kudgar frowned. He extended his magic once again, this time without any effort at finesse, and the illumination of his spell was like a lance to the creature's forehead. Soulripper arched in agony but stayed silent. Tell us! We care nothing for your world! Soulripper grunted, his hands clenching. Kadgar made a subtle move with his fingers, and this time Gaz Soul Ripper cried out, I need better than that. Ah! The dead thing bit its lip in pain, teeth sinking easily through rotten flesh. Our oh, destiny, greater than you can imagine, human. Kadgar's heart sped up, these half-truths, these hints. What was the reality? Sweat dotted his forehead, but not from exertion. He tightened his grip, and the Death Knight convulsed. Kadgar, Kadgar said Trillian, wincing a little. I can keep this up all day, Soul Ripper, Kedgar said. When there was no response, Kedgar lifted his left hand to join his right. An artifact! The Death Knight screamed from the tomb! The scepter of Sargaris! That's better. What about it? With that, the Book of Medivh and the Eye of Dalaran. There's no... No! Kedgar was surprised at the level of resistance the Death Knight could put up. He shared Turalyon's distaste of torture, but they were so close. What can he do? Tell us! He, he can open portals from Draenor to other worlds! Kedgar immediately ceased tormenting the Death Knight, who flopped over, groveling in recovery. He sat, stunned for a moment, then looked up at Turalyon. He saw his own horror mirrored in the youth's face. Of the worlds, Turalyon said, his voice faint with shock. Azeroth and Dragnor aren't the only ones. He stared down at the Death Knight, his mouth working for a moment before anything came out. Worlds more than ours. Worlds without end, innocence without number falling before them. Light save us, Kedgar nodded. I know it's difficult to grasp. The horde we faced was half crazed with desperation and hunger. Their world is dying and they needed to take ours. Now they're going to open portals to countless other worlds as well. The same scenario will be repeated again and again and again. Turalyon barely heard his friend's words. They seemed to fade away, smothered by the thudding of his own heart in his ears. The hideous visage of the Death Knight, too, was fading, drowning in a slow but steady glow of white light that seemed to be coming from inside the paladin's own head. He burned to protect his people, the Alliance, all life on this world from the havoc that the ever-hungering orcs had chosen to wreak. That seemed daunting enough, but now... Worlds? Just how many were they talking about anyway? One? Two? Two million? Hysteria bubbled up inside him as he sat in the white, empty space and danced on the verge of madness as he tried to comprehend the incomprehensible. The innocent were his charge. He had to protect them. But how could he possibly do so? So many who... The pounding of his heart suddenly paused. And in that place of pure, brilliant light, he saw a figure that was light. The light itself. 
It hovered and glowed, gleaming as if its form was hard and crystalline, but also soft, unspeakably soft, as soft as a tear, as soft as forgiveness, as soft as Illyria's pale skin. Golden strands draped the being, and Thralian could not tell at first if they were leading from or to the creature, and then he understood it was both. All that was, was this being, and this being was everything. Awe flooded him, and he drank in the sight of this beautiful, luminous being, filling it, fill him with hope and calm, as if he were an empty vessel. Do not despair, came a voice like bells, like chimes, like the sigh of the ocean. The light is with you. We are with you. No matter how vast the darkness, light will scatter it. No matter what world... No matter what creature, the light is there, in that place, in that soul. Know this and go forward with a joyful heart, Turalyon. As if it sang in response, Turalyon's heart began to beat once more. He realized it had never stopped, and the long, frozen, rapt moment had been less than the blink of an eye. Kadgar gave Turalyon the space to let it sink in. Finally, Turalyon lifted his head. His eyes were focused, clear, and his face was resolute. We have to stop them, Turalyon stated firmly. We can't let other innocent worlds have this, this unleashed on them. It ends here, on Azeroth. No one else should have to suffer as we have. The light shines on other worlds and ours, and it needs our help. It will have it. Khadgar heard some resentful murmurings from some of Turalyon's men. Turalyon heard it too, for he stood frowning. If you have something to say, say it clearly, he ordered. Soldiers who'd been talking exchanged glances, then one stepped up. Sir, why don't we just let them go? They have fresh worlds to take. Maybe they'll just go away and leave us alone. Even if it were that simple, we can't let that happen. Don't you understand? Trillian said. We have to stop them. We can't save our world at the expense of countless innocent lives. Besides, came Illyria's clear voice as she strode up to them, dusty and sweaty and spattered with blood too dark to be her own. What is to stop them from returning once they have gotten fat off plunder? With her sharp sense of hearing, of course, she'd heard everything. Kadgar thought her a trifle paler than usual, but she was almost eerily composed. Would you like would you like to battle a horde twice the size of the one we faced during the Second War, completely united, and with the ability to open portals to Azeroth from anywhere? Kadgar saw the disappointment in Turalyon's eyes. The paladin hoped the men would understand his point, and more he'd hoped Illyria would, but it seemed that Illyria was still consumed with hatred for the orcs. She did not really care about other worlds. She wanted to hunt the orcs down and kill them herself. She had no wish to let others share that particular cruel delight. She turned to Turalyon and color rose briefly in her face, then subsided. Sir, while we were fighting, I saw something I think you should be aware of. We'd noticed a group of... Kadgar was barely listening to her musical voice. Something else was nagging at his thoughts. Something was not right. He gasped as understanding burst upon him. I'm an idiot, Kedgar cried, cutting Illyria off in mid-sentence. They're not losing, he shouted. They're retreating. They found all the artifacts they needed and they're returning home to Draenor. The entire invasion was just a feint to distract us. And now they're done. Gaz Soul Ripper glanced up at him, shock and fear in his glowing eyes. The Death Knight surged to his feet, snapping the stout ropes that bound his hands and feet and chest. Terror lent him magical strength as well, and from somewhere deep inside, Kaz shunted aside Kedgar's mental lance and raised fresh shields that blocked the Archmage's reflexive attempt to regain control. You will not interfere, Kaz roared, leaping atop Kedgar and wrapping mailed hands around the Archmage's throat. You will not thwart our destiny! The Death Knight began to squeeze, and Kedgar gasped for air, struggling to push the creature away even as his vision swam. Blackness crept in along the edges of the site, framing wild colors flashing before him. He couldn't push the hands away. He couldn't 
think to summon a spell. And suddenly through the insanely swirling palette of colors came a flash of pure white. Even as it seared Kadgar's eyes, it wrapped him in reassuring warmth and a sensation of peace, sharply at odds with the pain of hands, crushing his windpipe and cutting off blood. Briefly, he wondered if he was already dead, but hadn't gotten around to noticing it yet. The light swelled, then faded. The dead hands around Kadgar's throat tightened convulsively before the pressure suddenly disappeared. Kadgar swayed, blinking, dazzled from the white light, coughing and gasping at the same time, and his lungs struggling to bring air back into his body. You're all right, it was Turalyon, his hands still glowing softly, helping Kadgar to rise. Glowing down, Kadgar noticed that his violet robe was now dusty gray, all that was left of Gaz Soul Ripper. He looked at Turalyon, stunned again by the young general's power. Turalyon read his glance and smiled sheepishly. Kadgar clasped his friend's arm. Thank you. It was the light, not I, Turalyon said with his characteristic modesty. Well, your damn light killed him too fast, Illyria growled. Even Kadgar blinked at the venom in her voice. We could have asked him about the carts I saw. Carts? Kadgar asked. Explain. She turned to him, clearly more comfortable speaking with the mage than with Turalyon. I saw some of the orcs going through the portal. Black dragons accompanied them. There were carts, several of them, all covered. They were taking things back to their world. They came to get artifacts, not souvenirs, grunted Kedgar. What do they need carts for? Illyria shrugged. I know not, but I thought you should know. Another puzzle piece, just when I thought we'd figured it out. Kedgar brushed disgustedly at his robe, then looked up at them. We've got quite the task ahead of us. We need to send an expedition into Dranor. We have to find and kill Nerjul before he can open any more portals, retrieve those artifacts, especially the Book of Medivh and Gul'dan's skull, and destroy the Dark Portal for good. Turalyon nodded, summoning a scout with quick gesture, every inch the military commander. Send word to the Alliance Kings, he said quickly. The hold is... His words were cut off as a shadow passed over the sun. Shielding his eyes from the glare, he glanced up and began to laugh as the shadow broke apart into several winged forms that circled down toward them. These were not arrow straight like dragons. They were broader, stouter, and softer, covered in tawny fur and feathers of gold and white. What took you? Turalyon called back, laughing with Kedgar, and as Kurdrin Wildhammer, leader of the Wildhammer dwarves, shook his head and managed to look embarrassed from atop his griffin. Bond wins, the dwarf admitted, bringing Skyrie in for landing. The great beast landed gracefully and cawed, flapping its wings one final time before its rider dismounted. Despite the direness of the situation, Kedgar found himself smiling. It was good to see Hale, Gruff, Kurdran. Your arrival is most timely, the archmage said, stepping forward to shake the dwarf's hand and permitting his own to be enthusiastically pumped up and down. We have a message to be delivered, and quickly. Oi, as long as you promise me and my boys will get a crack at those grain skins, We'll take a message for you. He waved at some of the other wild hammers who hastened forward and stood at attention. We'll need to dispatch several messages to the various leaders, Turalyon said, the grin fading. Kedgar wondered if Turalyon really knew just how no-nonsense he could look when he had to. Tell them this. The orcs are retreating to Dranor, but they have found a means to open new portals to other worlds. The dwarves' eyes widened, but they didn't interrupt. They are taking with them cartloads of something they obviously value. We do not yet know what, Turalyon continued. We intend to pursue them through the dark portal and to stop them from opening those portals by any and all means necessary. Are you sure, lad? asked Kurgeon quietly. Turalyon nodded. Everyone stood silently for a moment, knowing that Turalyon spoke what had to be done, but even so rendered mute at the reality. Now hurry, Turalyon said. Make that griffin earn her dinner. The scouts nodded, saluted, mounted their griffins, and took to the skies. Turalyon turned to his friends. And now, he said somberly, we prepare to leave our world behind. All right, so that kind of, I mean, it's questionable. I would say um, we can do the last level of the Horde campaign. Um, next, we've got to just kind of see what goes down. Um... Or there might be, we might have another chapter actually. This might be such a dense part that they're stretching it out to a second chapter. Once they go through the dark portal, 
um, we'll be able to look at, at that Arthas level. I mean, things start to, that's really where things happen because it's almost like this is two books in one. Really, this first half of this book was the Horde story. And, you know, there was some alliance sprinkled in, but it was getting us acclimate, uh, like adjust, acclimated and acquaintance with the Horde heroes and their mission and watching them get those artifacts and succeed and make it back to Draenor. Now, the second half is the Alliance, for the first time ever, going on to Draenor. All right, so we will see what happens next time. This episode's in the pipe, 5x5. Five five. I thank everybody so much for watching, and I'll see you next time on Lore of Warcraft.